I want to talk to you about what happens in your life when you make the commitment to read the Bible daily. Here's an interesting study that I found online. And this group, well, I'll just read what I have here. In 2009, the Center for Biblical Engagement issued a report that concluded that people who read the Bible at least four days a week experience the following benefits. Statistical analysis reveal that, controlling for other factors, Christians who are engaged in Scripture most days of the week have lower odds, listen to this, of participating in these behaviors, getting drunk, and this is for those who read the Scripture at least four times a week, getting drunk, 57% lower odds. Sex outside of marriage, 68% lower odds. Pornography, 61% lower odds. Gambling, 74% lower odds. Any of these habits in aggregate, 57% lower odds. More scripture engagement also produces a Christian who is more involved in spreading the good news. So it doesn't just help you to be rid of certain bad habits. Look, it also adds some positivity. Controlling for other factors, those who read or listen to the Bible at least four days a week have higher odds of participating in these behaviors. Sharing faith with others. This one astonished me. Sharing faith with others, 228% higher odds. Discipling others, 231% higher odds. I love this. Memorizing scripture, 407% higher odds. So certainly there are effects that are measurable when you begin to become committed to the word. If you're ready to get committed to the word in this season, or if you're already committed to the word and you're ready to go deeper, I want you to write in the comment section right now, I love the word. Let that be your public declaration of faith. I want you to shout it. I want you to say it. I want you to be proud of it. Write it in the comment section. I love the word. These days, substance is so rare. We hear a lot of preaching with fluff, and we, we like to have our trends over truth. But when you begin to become established on the word, there is a substance within your speech. There's a substance when you teach and when you preach. There's a substance when you share with your loved ones. Now, it's time that we know the word like never before. And I mean, be established on the foundations of the word truly, deeply, sincerely. Because think of all that's coming against us in the culture today, in the nations, um, in the world as a whole. There are all these different ideas and philosophies, and it seems like there's a lot of confusion and a lot of people are walking on sinking sand. They have no firm foundation by which they can gain their bearings. So it's time to know the word of God like never before. It's time to read it like never before. It's time to memorize it like never before. It's time to quote it like never before. It's time to devote to it like never before and declare it like never before. We need to go deeper. We need to develop this hunger for the word. It's the bread of life. Well, Jesus, of course, is the bread of life, but the very words he speaks are also spirit and life. It's time to go deeper. I want to know the word of God so well that if I were to ever be imprisoned for practicing my faith, I could devote to the word of God still daily through memory. That's something I want for my life. I want not just to be in the word. I want the word to be within me. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to read a few verses here. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into the boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil, with underlying rock, the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have any deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Verse 8, still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. 
Let's go down to verse 11. Jesus says, You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. Now listen to this. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away. And that's why, of course, he spoke in parables. Now, here Jesus is talking about the stewardship of revelation. That is that when one is given the responsibility of a revelation, if they embrace that and live by that, more will be added to their understanding. But if they reject that or neglect it or take it for granted and don't live by it, then even what little understanding they have will be taken away. Now, Jesus explains to us the meaning of this parable very plainly. If we simply jump down to verse 16, we'll see his explanation. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Now, listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Verse 20, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Now, Jesus says so much here, and there's a, there's a richness, of course, to every word that Christ speaks. But even as I look over these particular scriptures, there are so many things that we can glean from this. I want to focus here. Let's look at verse 22 again. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. Well, isn't that the case with many of us today? I think that's the day and age in which we live, where distraction abounds. We're pulled away by our worries. We're pulled away by the lure of the world. So think about the fact that some Muslims know the Quran better than many Christians know the word. Some atheists know the word better than some Christians know the word. And we have to be people who are so committed to the word that we become experts in the scripture. We are without excuse. We have the teachings of scripture. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. And we have, of course, that inspiration that comes from the Holy Spirit that begins to take the word and actually cause effect and change in our everyday lives. We are without excuse when it comes to the word. Christians should know the Bible. Christians should have a depth of understanding when it comes to the scripture. Christians in general need to make this book a part of their life in a way that is profound, in a way that is deep, in a way that is life transforming. Luke chapter 5 verse 15 says this, but despite Jesus's instructions, the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. Well, look at the ministry of Jesus. What was it that caused his ministry to have such fruitfulness, such effectiveness? Well, of course, he was a perfect reflection of the Father God, and he didn't do anything outside of the will of the Father. But looking at the practical measures by which he used in terms of his methodology, um, we see that Jesus would preach and he would perform miracles. So the word and spirit, the word and power, these were foundational to even the way he moved. Why? Because the word attracted the people. They came to hear him preach. They came to hear words of life. And, you know, we have our complaints in terms of what we think is wrong in the church today. And we do our best to make adjustments as a whole. I'm speaking generally for the body of Christ. But the general idea is that if we simply want to reach more people, then we need less of the word. And I know at least in certain parts of American culture, I don't know what it's like in other nations necessarily, but this has become a prevalent idea, sadly, 
But it's actually the exact opposite that is true. In fact, people want substance. People want the supernatural. People want the depth of the word of God. And if we would only give it to them, then it would attract people. If we would only give them the truth, that would be life-giving. The words that we speak would be spirit and life, and people would recognize that life in our words. But we can't have that flowing out of us if we're not pouring it into us through the daily reading of God's word. So the word attracts people. It's the key to building a ministry with longevity. And that's how powerful the word is. It helps you to know God's voice and God's nature, and it brings power upon your life. So we as Christians need to, number one, read the Word. And that is a a commitment that needs to be daily. We need to read the Word. Number two, we need to study the Word. That is, we should know what the background is in, for example, Paul's letters. We should understand the historical and cultural backdrops of the various different books of the Bible. We should understand the themes and the tone. We should understand the purpose of each book. We should understand why an author wrote it and extract from these verses the meaning that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, we have this idea that when we go to the Word of God, it's like reading a fortune cookie where we hear something and then we go, well, this is what it means to me. And certainly we should receive of the Word of God daily encouragement, daily correction, daily sustenance, and it should speak to us personally. But this doesn't mean that we decide what the scripture intends to say. This doesn't mean that we can take our meaning and then project it onto the scripture. That's not how we go about it. Studying the word of God isn't about taking your ideas and then forcing them into the scripture. Studying the word of God is about saying, Holy Spirit, what were you communicating here? And how does it apply to my everyday life? So we study the word. And then we meditate on the word. No, meditate is not a bad word. Just read Psalm chapter one. Meditation is simply repetition in thought. And as we meditate on the word, it becomes a part of us. So if reading the word is like eating the word, meditation is like digestion. And then we must live and obey the word. And as we live and obey the word, it actually has impact in our everyday lives. And then, of course, we must declare the word. But we can't declare the word if the word is not in us. So here's what begins to happen when you do this. Hopefully, as I'm speaking, there's a hunger being stirred in you. There's this cultivation of this desire for the word of God in your everyday life. And I could go on and on and on about, you know, the responsibility that the believer has to know the scripture. But let's talk about some of the benefits that result when you become a person of the word. And I mean, you know the word not the Instagram post of the day, not the tweetable scripture of the day. I'm talking about knowing the depths of the word and understanding the richness therein. Number one, here's what begins to happen. You begin to read the word of God every day. Number one, you'll walk free from sin. You do not have to settle for this ebb and flow, this back and forth, this constantly slipping into your old patterns and ways. You don't have to invite the old patterns to come back season after season. When you begin to know the word, you walk free from sin. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, how does that work? Well, you begin to know his mind, his nature, his desires, his likes, his dislikes. You learn what pleases him. You learn what displeases him. And then you live accordingly. And as you live accordingly, you begin to notice the fruit of that word in your life. But you have to have the word in you if you're going to have resistance against sin. And so think about the first temptation. The first thing the enemy did when he wanted to tempt Adam and Eve was he questioned the word. He contradicted the word. Genesis chapter 3, we see it plainly. First, he says, did God really say? He questions the word. And then he said, you will not die. Then he contradicts the word. So before the enemy can contradict the word, he'll question the word. And the only reason any of us will question the word in the first place is because we are not devoted to the word. So I'll hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's number one, you'll walk free from sin. Number two, you'll prosper in all you do. No, prosperity is not an ugly word. No, prosperity is not unbiblical. And anyone who thinks that prosperity is not of God hasn't read the scripture. Now, I understand that the message of prosperity has been abused. Definitely, we can admit that. And we must certainly avoid the abuse and overemphasis of prosperity. But still, prosperity is a byproduct of knowing and living the word. This doesn't mean 
that everything in your life will always line up exactly how you want it to line up. This doesn't mean that you'll never face any trials or tragedies, nor does this mean that God owes us these things or that we serve him simply for the purpose of what we gain from him. No, but in fact, we understand that the scripture establishes principles of prosperity and knowing his instruction and word is one of them. Joshua 1.8 says this, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Well, think about Psalm chapter one again, referencing that. Those who meditate on the law of the Lord or on the word of the Lord day and night, they bear fruit in each season. They prosper in all they do. So we have to understand that there is a fruitfulness that comes when we become people of the word. Prosperity comes. Being a person of the word attracts the resources that you need for your calling. Being a person of the word attracts supply. It attracts abundance. Now again, let me balance this because I know there's a lot of negativity when it comes to the concept of prosperity. Uh, but prosperity is not a bad thing. It is biblical. As long as we keep it in its proper place, and we don't overemphasize it or abuse that message, then prosperity can definitely find its way within the life of the believer. Number three, you will walk in truth. As I was mentioning earlier, think about the fact that all of these messages are coming at us from all different angles, all different directions, people vying for our attention, messages screaming at us to believe the truth or the ideas, I should say, that they want to push. James 1.22 says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So we're deceived. We are self-deceived. If we don't allow the word of God to become so much a part of our lives that we're actually practicing what it says. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So the things we tell ourselves, the things other people tell us, the way that we're swayed by every whim, that can be quite damaging to the life of the believer. And this is why we need the word of God to safeguard us against strange doctrine, to safeguard us against deception, to safeguard us against doctrines of demons. First Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons, doctrines of demons. Well, how do you protect yourself against that? Know the word. And guys, we are living, I don't mean to inspire fear. I should say this. There are some things that I'm hearing that are really concerning in terms of preachers and pastors who are abandoning the scripture in order to try to gain favor with the world. And this is something we ought not to be doing. We need to be grounded on the word now more than ever. Why? Because the key to reaching the world is not going to be found in compromising the word, but doubling down on the word. So, so far we've seen you will walk free from sin. And, and on that note, I know I already made that point, but let me just add this to point number one. On that point, you may be wondering how you're going to resist temptation. You may be wondering if you're ever going to be free, but here's the reality. The word of God doesn't just change your habits. This is for someone watching, I know it. The word of God doesn't just change your habits. The word of God begins to transform your very nature. And out of that new nature comes new desires so that you're going to get to the point, if you become committed to the word, eventually you'll get to the point where you're not even tempted by those things that once tempted you to where what once lured you in will repulse you. So you gain entirely new desires. So one way of battling sin is to fight the temptation, fight the desires, uh, to fight that pool on your life or on your flesh, that craving. But if you go deep into the word, eventually the word transforms you in such a profound way that those desires for that sin itself, the desires themselves become weakened. So number one, you'll walk free from sin. Number two, you'll prosper in all you do. Number three, you'll walk in truth. And by the way, the moment you start neglecting the word, now you're opening the door to deception. Number four, you'll walk in faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith cometh by hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ, or faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, this verse is about faith for salvation and that those who hear the gospel message have their faith produced for that gospel message. So that's the power of the gospel message. 
When it's preached, it produces faith in the listener. But the general takeaway principle, the spiritual principle that can be applied across the board is the fact that the word will give you faith for what it promises. Write that in the comment section. The word will give you faith for what it promises. When the word promises something and we receive that promise by receiving the word, we are stirring our faith. Our faith is being grown and exercised. So the word produces faith for what it promises. Number five, you'll walk in wisdom. Psalm 119, 130 says, the teaching of your word gives light. So even the simple can understand. Psalm 119, 30 again. So the teaching of your word gives light. So even the simple can understand. I love that scripture. The word illuminates situations. The word illuminates relationships. The word illuminates your path so that where you were in confusion at one point, as you become a person of the word, now you begin to walk with confidence, with certainty. You know, when you're walking around in the dark, maybe as to not disturb your spouse if you need to get up for a glass of water or to not wake a sleeping child if you need to walk in the dark, there's this caution, there's this worry. Am I going to step on a toy? Am I going to bump my knee against the wall? Am I going to come up against the bed here? Am I going to hurt myself in the dark? There's this caution. There's this fear. There's this confusion. It's slow movement. But as soon as the light comes on, there's a confident walk. Why? Because I can see where I'm going. Well, if you're not in the word, no wonder you're, you're, you lack confidence for the direction of your life. And I say that not to condemn you, but to show you something that maybe can use some correction and therefore will bring fruit. Correction is good. It's God's love for you when he corrects you. So when you get the word of God in you, you get that wisdom now. Now suddenly that light goes on and you can see, oh, that's what, that's what the situation really was. Oh, that was their intention. Oh, that was where I was deceived. And now you walk in confidence and you're not stumbling around in the dark. So you walk in wisdom. Number six, you'll walk in peace. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law. Grace, peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, when we live in the peace of God that comes from living on the foundation of the word, we're not really shaken by much. People of the word are calm, cool, level-headed when everyone around them is losing their mind. When there's a situation that causes others to be frantic and stirred and worried and biting their nails, people of the word are stable. People of the word are consistent. People of the word are level-headed. They're not constantly jumping around based on their emotions. They're not just reacting to situations. They walk in peace. So if tragedy hits, there's peace. If trials hit, there's peace. If people attack them, there's peace. You know, you can't, I shouldn't say you can't. It's not entirely impossible. Rather, I should say it's very difficult to offend someone who's a person of the word. Why? Because they have their confidence in the Lord. Little criticism there, little, little issue there. They're, 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 they're very easy. Um, they're, they're very difficult to, to disrupt they walk in this peace that comes from being grounded on the foundation of the word. So there could be chaos all around, but peace within. Number seven, you'll walk in strength. Psalm 119, 28 says, My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. If there's no substance in your life, you will crumble under the pressures of life. If what is in you, this is a word I'm telling you, if what is in you, is not strong enough to bear what is coming upon you, you'll crumble under the pressure. And this is why people who are in ministry, especially need to be people of the word. Well, really, all believers need to be people of the word. But think about the minister who tries to take on a new season of ministry, a new weight of responsibility, and the word isn't really in them anymore. And so the weight of that ministry now begins to press down on them. But because what is in them isn't strong enough to hold what's coming upon them, there's a crushing. They start to lose their mind. They become unstable emotionally. These issues actually affect real people. Or just the believer in general who is not in taking the word, the pressures of life, the responsibilities of marriage, of being a parent, of having a career, of serving in the church, of evangelism, all the things that God has called you to be. Those pressures come on you 
and God may even increase those responsibilities as time goes on. But if what is in you is not strong enough to support what is coming upon you, that's when there's an unhealthy crushing. But the word gives you strength. The word gives you life and vitality. The word gives you momentum in your spiritual walk so that you're not necessarily running on just fumes. You're not necessarily just trying to make it through to where you're saying, I don't know how much longer I can do this. Or maybe you're giving from your own strength. I mean, if you're exhausted, the question has to be asked out of what source are you giving? And if you're giving out of the source of the spirit, then of course that is sourced by the word. And there is strength and vitality and momentum to that spiritual walk. Number eight, you'll walk in vulnerability toward God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now, this is so key. Lord, help me communicate this. This is so key. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Well, to who does it do that for? Or to who does it expose our innermost thoughts and desires? To God? He already sees everything. Psalm 139, even the darkness is like day to him. He can see everything. He sees motives. He sees thoughts. He sees secrets. He sees everything. And so it's not like when we read the word, suddenly God can see into our hearts. No. What does it do? The scripture causes us to see into our own motives to see into our own lives. It separates soul and spirit, that which is of the Holy Spirit, that which is of self. God already knows this, but it exposes the innermost you. This is why, by the way, as you're reading through Scripture, you should say, Lord, help me to examine myself. And as you're reading through Scripture, I say this often, but it's because it's true and, and it's worth repeating. When I read the Scripture, I'm saying, Lord, there's so many ways I'm not like, like you. There's so many ways I'm not like Jesus. Then I say to the Lord, help me be more like you. Help me be more like Jesus. Why? Because as you're reading, you're taking in truths that are contradicting things in your life that shouldn't be so. As you're reading, there's, there's, it's like looking into a mirror now, and you can see your spiritual reflection in the mirror of the Word of God. I'll say that again. You can see your spiritual reflection in the mirror of the Word of God. The Word of God is a mirror for your soul and spirit. And as you begin to look at the Word, now you're starting to see flaws. I mean, think about when you look at your face in the morning before you head out in the day. There's imperfections that you need to take care of. And sometimes you're glad that there was a mirror because maybe there's an imperfection that you didn't quite notice that would have been embarrassing had you stepped outside and just walked through the day like that. So we have this mirror that reflects back to us what we should look like, or rather what we do look like, and therefore we see what we should look like. It shows your mindsets. It shows your emotions. It shows your character flaws. This is why Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Why? Because he sees the glory of God, and the glory of God exposes that which is wrong about him. This is why, by the way, people who draw closer to the Lord sometimes mistakenly think, and again, sometimes mistakenly think, that the Lord is pushing them away. Because now they're beginning to see their flaws. This is what begins to happen here. Watch. You start to examine yourself. You read the word, okay? You're daily committing to it. And the more you read the word, the more you realize, I need to change this. I need to change that. Help me, Holy Spirit. And really, he's the one who changes it. Um, we simply abide. He produces the fruit. But part of abiding is being in the word. And we, we receive the word. And now we're saying, okay, I need to repent here. I need to surrender that. Lord, I give this area to you. And so you might become frustrated with yourself as you begin to see all of these things. Here's why. It's not that you're becoming less of a Christian. It's not that God is rejecting you. Here's what's happening. As you read the word, your tolerance for sin and character flaws is lowered. So now what used to be no big deal to you bothers you greatly. Now when you become a person of the word, the little compromises that you thought you can just shrug off, now they begin to cause this deep internal, um, how shall I put this, this, this brokenness over that sin, this brokenness over those character flaws. Why? Because now I'm drawing closer to the Lord and the closer I get to him, the brighter his light shines. And the brighter his light shines, 
the more the details of my heart and mind begin to show. And I say, Lord, I'm broken. Lord, I'm undone. Lord, I'm not like you. And the word makes you vulnerable in that way. See, if we're not in the word, we think we got it all together. We walk with an unhealthy confidence in self and we're moving about our day thinking there's nothing wrong. There are no issues. Oh, but the moment you get in the word, you go, oh, I was deceived there. I need to change that. Oh my goodness, this is an area the Lord is convicting me in. And instead of being discouraged by that, celebrate that because this means God is working on you. This means his correction is having effect. This means your tolerance for sin and compromise is being lessened. So I pray you're hungry for the word. I pray that God is stirring this in you. Father, I thank you for each one receiving this now. And I ask you, precious Holy Spirit, to begin to cause them to desire the word. And Lord, as you give them the desire, remind them that they must make the decision to be in the word. We want to see the fruit of your word born in our lives. Help us to draw closer to you through this basic spiritual practice. Give them, Lord, that committed spirit. Give them, Lord, a hunger for your word. And I rebuke guilt and condemnation. Some of you right now, even as we're praying, you're, 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 it's almost like you're hesitating to make that commitment because A, you think you're going to fail at it. You're not. That's a lie from the enemy. Or B, you think that God is so angry with you because you've been inconsistent that you should be condemned. No, that's a lie from the enemy. I rebuke that guilt and condemnation that would keep them from making this commitment. I rebuke that fear of failure that would keep them from making this commitment in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Lord, we tear down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And I pray, Lord, your truth be established in their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to type it because you believe it. Type amen. Well, if you think others can be encouraged by this message, help us spread the word by simply leaving a like on this video. Yes, that actually helps us to spread this word. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I release content on the Holy Spirit, prayer, and spiritual warfare. We also show the power of the Holy Spirit moving around the world at our various different events that we host all around the world where people are saved, healed, delivered, and empowered. And now I wanna challenge you here. I know it's tempting. The lesson's done, the prayer's done, and it's tempting now to go and click on what's next. But May I have just a moment of your time, if you'll allow it, please. I want to challenge you to get involved with this ministry. Help us on our mission to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. Don't count yourself out. You may say, well, there's not much I can do, or I'm not sure about the impact that I can have. But I'll tell you this right now. You, with the collective of the believers around the world who are committed to this, are going to make a huge impact. It is in our togetherness that we have exponential impact. It is in our togetherness that we make a huge dent and we begin to see the gospel go forward. We will see the soul of a generation turned toward Jesus. We will see a great revival. The great commission will not fail. The gospel has not lost power. Jesus will be preached among the nations. So get involved it's, it's, it's a win, I'm telling you. We are not fighting a losing battle against the powers of darkness. It's a win. Jesus already has the victory. We just need to go get the harvest now. The harvest is ready. The harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. So partner with us. Become a monthly supporter of this ministry by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single donation by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. And I challenge you to do something right now. Just pause Ask the Holy Spirit what he wants you to do. Maybe you've been blessed by this ministry in some way. Maybe you've been helped. It's time to get involved now. It's time to do your part. It's time to pay it forward. Let's do this. We can win the world to Jesus. One more time, davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to become a monthly ministry supporter, and that's very key. Or you can go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate to give a single gift. Do try to give on the website. The website takes all different currencies from all different countries. We even take cryptocurrency and stock donations. Only if the website doesn't work for you, then and only then give through other means like YouTube and Facebook because YouTube and Facebook take big chunks out. So try to give via the website. I so appreciate you. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your support. And remember until next time, nothing is impossible with God.